location. I teach in a university. I am a professional social scientist engaged in certain kind of discourses. And when I look at that entire body of knowledge which we cultivate in the university, which is all around and which is very powerful, and when I look at that body of knowledge, I see there are two powerful critiques of Gandhi. There are two powerful critiques of Gandhi. And at times, one gets almost carried away by these two powerful critiques of Gandhi. As a student of social science, as a university person, I cannot skip these two powerful ideologies of the critique of Gandhi. And these two powerful critiques of Gandhi emerge from certain kind of politics of debunking of Gandhi. Let me briefly state about this two powerful critiques. The first critique, I would say, that emerge from the ideologist of what we call the very modernist notion of progress. And this ideology, we all know, began to emerge out of the shadow of European enlightenment. And it was an ideology that believed in certain kind of epistemological optimism centered on the almost miraculous capacity of modern science and technology to deliver humankind from toil and labor and take humankind to certain kind of a secular paradise based on unlimited growth and unlimited development. It was an ideology of progress which believed in the linearity of historical development and historical progress, believed in man's almost unlimited capacity cultivated by modern rationality, modern reason, modern science and technology, and that would eventually take us to the land of freedom and happiness and prosperity. There are three components to this ideology. One component of this ideology of progress would reflect itself in what is often called in the Western philosophy a very liberal utilitarian doctrine of a self-centered, self-defined, atomized individual concerned with the maximization of his pleasure. A rational, self-defined, self-maximizing individual concerned with his benefit, with his pleasure, and an individual gifted with a bundle of rights and the notion of freedom. Its second component manifests itself in certain notion of Marxian socialism, where a very centralized state, monopolizing the destiny of the community and the society, and the state engaged in the collective welfare of the entire nationality, entire nation. So it is the doctrine of a centralized, powerful, secular state engaged in a project of modernization and collective welfare. And its third component is in a notion of culture, public culture, that would become increasingly dissociated from the realm of the metaphysical and from the realm of the transcendental. So these three components of this philosophy of progress, of this ideology of progress, you know, that emerged. And that indeed was a very powerful ideology. And in the context of that ideology, we'd often notice that Gandhi became a major source of embarrassment. Can you please switch off your mobile, please? That's not fair. Uh, <coughs> sorry. Uh, so in that ideology of progress, Gandhi became a certain kind of embarrassment. Because Gandhi was speaking a language, and Gandhi was leading a kind of life and politics that exactly didn't fit into that ideology of progress, which emerged out of the shadow of European enlightenment, reflecting itself in utilitarian individualism, in Marxian socialism, or in a notion of a secular culture increasingly dissociating itself from all that is metaphysical and transcendental. Gandhi became an embarrassment, embarrassment in such a doctrine. 
Because unlike the utilitarian notion of the individual, Gandhi was imagining a man not just with a bundle of rights, but a man with a strong ethical moral duties. Unlike the doctrine of a very powerful state delivering humankind, Gandhi, with his anarcho-romanticism, was imagining certain kind of a decentralized polity based on oceanic circles rather than a very powerful state. And unlike the notion of a culture which has dissociated itself from the domain of the transcendental and the metaphysical, Gandhi again and again was invoking his invisible voice, invoking the spiritual domain and invoking the religious symbols and the metaphor. All that led to a situation in which the ideologist of progress would have a tremendous sense of discomfort with all that Gandhi symbolized. And one would be warned that be aware of Gandhi. If you romanticize Gandhi, if you idealize Gandhi, there is a danger that Gandhi might well be appropriated by the silly romantics, by those idiots who romanticize tradition and all that goes on in the name of tradition and who do not like anything about the modern project. So that's where there are many ideologists of progress who would try to debunk Gandhi and alert us that be conscious, be aware of that man. He could well be appropriated by the traditionalist, by the Puritans, by the conservative elements, and Gandhi could indeed become a danger to the ideology of progress. The second powerful ideology that emerged, which I would argue, is the ideologist of certain kind of a left subaltern radical politics. Once again, it has two components. One is, of course, from the Marxian notion of the class struggle, which is based on certain notion of a true consciousness emerging out of the doctrine of historical dialectical materialism, which seeks to overcome the falsehood of bourgeois ideology and all that which goes on in the name of bourgeois ideology of morals, religiosity, peace, and cooperation, and brotherhood, and solidarity, because it is being seen as something that actually falsifies and hides the real contradictions. The roots of this contradiction lie in the hard economic infrastructure. So it is a doctrine of a class struggle which aims at altering the hard economic infrastructure and based on certain notion of a true consciousness which would emerge from a doctrine of the dialectical historical materialism and a materialistic conception of history and which would eventually falsify the ideological distortions and that entire bourgeois notions of the peace, non-cooperation, or the uh, <coughs> non-violence and harmony. The second component of that ideology would emerge from the subalternist, mainly from people like Perrier and Ambedkar, and particularly from Ambedkar, where he would raise his voice against a highly stratified, hierarchical, caste-ridden society, derive his inspiration from the slogans of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, and fraternity, and try to integrate it with Buddhism as certain kind of a protest against Brahminical Hinduism, and fight his battle, and imagine a society free from caste hierarchy and caste oppression. Now, in these two branches of that radical left subaltern politics, once again, Gandhi didn't occupy much space. And the proponents of this ideology would once again evolve a very sharp and penetrating critique of Gandhi. And in that critique, we could see early Marxists like Rajnipam Dutt, Emin Roy, and then Perrier and Ambedkar all would converge and a very serious, powerful critique of Gandhi would begin to evolve. One of the early Marxists, Rajnipam Dutt, would accuse that Gandhi was like the only romantic European who were not willing to face the reality of existence and they were trying to escape the harsh realities. So harsh realities 
of the economic conflict and contradiction, as Rajnipam Dutt would argue, Gandhi was trying to scale and imagining almost like a romantic, a vision of a very ideal village swaraj and a communitarian life who are trying to escape the harsh realities of contemporary economic struggle and the conflict. M. N. Roy would accuse Gandhi of being a medieval Puritan, and Ambedkar would call Gandhi a silly fool, a political shoemaker whom one could only laugh at. And Perrier would argue that Gandhi was one of the enemy he is trying to fight and overcome. So there would be powerful critique, you know, emanating from that left subaltern politics against all that Gandhi symbolized. The kind of setting I come from, the kind of setting I come from, my social science, my discursive reasoning, my university knowledge system, in which these two powerful critiques, which are emerging from certain politics of debunking of Gandhi, are very powerful. And as I have said, it is very difficult not to get carried away by these two powerful critiques of Gandhi, because these critiques are very powerful, coming, coming with a lot of force from the ideologist of progress and from the ideologist of the left subaltern politics. But then, as I begin to contemplate, as I begin to reflect, and that is what I wish to share, that from that politics of debunking, then when I begin to contemplate, and in that process of contemplation, I begin to see that these two ideologies, the ideology of progress and the ideology of left subaltern radical politics and their critique of Gandhi, even when some of the points which they make are indeed very important points, but that, that, knows, that, that doesn't satisfy me completely and wholeheartedly. And at that moment of contemplation, I just begin to ask myself that, and I begin to see myself as someone who is agitated, who is troubled. And it is this agitation, and it is this troubled soul that gets disturbed while seeing the sunrise in the early morning and thinking of Tagore's crisis in civilization and 30th January 1948, Gandhi's assassination. So a series of confessions began to emerge. And I felt that from the politics of debunking, I would come to the confessions of a troubled soul. And I would try to see that in my confessions, whether now Gandhi somehow began to make sense in my confessions. Who was Gandhi after all? Gandhi, any serious reader of Gandhi would argue that at the end of the day, Gandhi was a man of confessions. Gandhi confessed again and again, right from that bold confession that what happened when he went to a brother and what happened you know, when he was engaged with Kosturba and his father passed away. And Gandhi was a man of confession and many of his confessions, Nirmal Kumar Bosch wrote in my days with Gandhi at the last phase of Gandhi a man of confessions. So I thought that it would be appropriate if an ordinary mortal like me, with his troubled and agitated mind and with his troubled soul, begin to confess and begins to ask a series of existential questions and then begin to look at Gandhi once again and go beyond these two powerful ideologies of debunking of Gandhi. So my first confession is about the question that this agitated mind, this troubled soul asks itself, that is it possible for me to reconcile work and contemplation, to reconcile work and meditation? We all, we know, are engaged in the domain of activity, in the domain of work. Even for a second, you and I cannot skip the domain of work. I'm working and working all the time as a father, as a student, as a friend, as a university professor, as a teacher, as a citizen, as a political activist, I'm working and working all the time. But then the question haunts me, 
Is my work a set of bondage, a source of bondage for me? Whether in the process of work, I am becoming egoistic. Whether in the process of work, my ego gets inflated and I, my ego begins to tell that it is you, it is you, your ego, who does the work and it is your ego that matters. Am I becoming a victim of my ego? And if my ego becomes bigger and bigger in the process of my work, am I becoming a slave of the ego? Am I becoming agitated, restless, ambitious, neurotic, without any sense of calm, without any sense of rest? It is at that juncture my first confession begins that is it possible for me to work in a way that work itself becomes an act of renunciation. The work itself becomes an act of contemplation and meditation. Is it possible for me to work and to live in the world and at the same time seeing work as certain kind of a yoga, a certain kind of meditation and calmness and remaining calm and peaceful? So that was what was bothering me, that the confession one that I just posed before you. The second confession is that I open my eyes and I see that I find myself in a world full of injustice, full of brutality, violence and exploitation. And then this troubled soul feels like resisting, revolting, protesting. And I realize that the resistance becomes such an integral part of human existence. We are protesting, we are revolting, we are resisting. We are resisting against injustice, violence, exploitation, brutality. But then again, the trouble sort ask a question that why I am resisting? Why am I revolting? When I am revolting against the bourgeoisie, is it because I am revolting against the bourgeoisie because today I am being deprived of the privileges that the bourgeoisie as a class has gotten access to? And tomorrow, out of my revolt, I will have the similar access to the privileges that the bourgeoisie have. When as a colonized, I am revolting against the colonizers, am I revolting because tomorrow I wish to become like the colonizer and enjoy the similar brute force and the similar power. I am a lower caste. I am fighting against the upper caste, against the Brahminical domination. Am I fighting because tomorrow I wish to become the oppressor like the Brahmins or like the Brahminical caste? Or am I revolting for some other reason? Am I revolting because I am trying to wish, I, I wish to overcome that entire duality of the oppressor and the oppressed and the colonizer and the colonized and the Brahmin and the Dalit and I am trying resisting and resistance emerging out of certain prayer, prayer of collective redemption, collective welfare or am I resisting merely because of anger merely because of revenge, merely because of hatred, and merely because of my own selfish urge to gain what today I miss. Today is oppressed, becoming tomorrow's oppressors. Today's colonized, become tomorrow's colonizers. Today's subaltern, become tomorrow's rulers. Am I revolting for that, or whether in my resistance there is a notion of prayer for collective redemption, overcoming the dualities of the friend and the enemy, colonizer and the colonized, oppressor and the oppressed, and the Brahmin and the Dalit. So that's a question, that's a confession I just ask myself. And is it possible then to have a sense of resistance and resistance as a kind of prayer? So the first confession, is it possible to have work as offering, as renunciation, as meditation and contemplation? And the second, is can resistance be an act of prayer? The third confession is about freedom and indulgence.